Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. Welcome to a short video on the wrist and the hand. So if we have a look at the two bones or two sets of bones that we have here to start off with, the wrist joint, the distal end of the radius and the ulna, they come together and form a pivot joint just like they did at the proximal radio or ulna joint around the elbow. Now we know that the ulna bone is the bone which stays still and it's the radius which is pivoting around the ulna like this. So in this position, the hand would be upright, right, the palm facing towards the sky, and this is called the supine position. If we then rotate the radius around the ulna like this, we can see that the hand would follow with it, and this is the prone position or pronated. So at the wrist, well, specifically the distal radio ulna joint, we have a pivot type articulation, which indeed is synovial, and it's the radius which pivots, palm facing upwards is the supine position or supinated, and then palm downwards is the prone position or pronated position. Now we have muscles specifically for these actions like uh, the supinator, which we discussed in the forearm muscle uh, video, and then also the biceps brachii. So these two muscles create supination. And then for pronation, we would have pronator teres and pronator quadratus. Now these muscles here are innervated by your median nerve, the supinated by radial and the biceps brachii by the muscular cutaneous, which we talked about in the neurovascular video. Now then what we have is we have the articulation between the distal end of the radius and the two of the proximal row of carpal bones like this. So what we can actually see is that the ulna does not contact the carpus, all right, or the carpal bones. So there is an indirect articulation which is occurring here. So that's why when you pronate, the hand would rotate with the ulna, uh, with the radius, sorry, and the ulna stays still. So if we have a look at the bones that we can see here, you can see that we have eight individual carpal bones, and they articulate in two rows. So having a look at these two rows of carpal bones, we can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight individual bones, and they're organized in two rows, the proximal row and the distal row. So in the proximal row of bones, you have the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and the pisiform. Now, interestingly, the pisiform is actually a sesamoid type bone, just like that of your patella. So it's embedded within a tendon, and that's one of the flexor tendons of your wrist. This bone here with the hook on it is the hamate, then we have the capitate, the trapezoid here trapped in between all the bones, and the trapezium, which is under your thumb. So there's a few different ways that you can remember this. Now you can look up the mnemonics for the carpal bones on Google to find out a few different ones, but one that we can do here is we can say that the scaphoid, we can say so long the pinky, here comes the thumb. So we're moving towards the pinky finger, which is on the medial aspect, and then we're moving towards the thumb. So, so long the pinky, here comes the thumb. So if we say the names of them again, it's a scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, so long the pinky, here comes the thumb, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. Now you can see that the proximal row of bones, as we said, they articulate with the radius, but the distal row of bones, they articulate with the metacarpals. So here you would have your radiocarpal articulation between the distal radius, scaphoid, and lunate. Then your midcarpal joint runs in between these bones along this line here between the two rows, and then you would have your carpal and metacarpal joints, so articulations uh, more distally. Now, when we flex the wrist, it's the motion of the proximal row about the radius. 
when we go to then extend the wrist, the scaphoid and the lunate, they're locked in place and it's the motion of the uh, secondary row or the distal row on the proximal row like this. So full range of extension is it's done at the mid carpal joint and full range of flexion is done at the radiocarpal. Now the carpal metacarpal joint itself, these four, you know, articulation two, three, four and five, these are immobile, whereas the first one is mobile. So this is a type of uh, saddle joint, right? So just like a horse, so you can see that its shape has got like a saddle type um, uh, orientation. Now what it allows your thumb to do is to adduct, abduct, flex, extend, and then come all the way across here to see your pinky finger and that's called opposition. So this joint here is highly mobile and you use it quite a lot in your life. So the whole term of opposable thumbs comes from this. So if we have a look at this template, which will be posted onto your Learn Online page, we can have a go at labeling some of these bones. So just really quickly, you can see that this one here, this would be the radius. Then you would have here the ulna. And now what you can do here is anything, any time that you see a joint like this, you can put them together and you can call this the distal radio ulna. And then what you can do is you can describe that from what we did before. So we said that it was a pivot type joint and it's the radius which is moving around there. This one here is the scaphoid. Then we have the lunate, triquitrum, pisiform hamate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. All right, so always remember that the trapezium is under the thumb. Now, if we continue up into the rest of the bones inside the hand, we have five metacarpals, and they're numbered one, two, three, four, and five. Now, the midline of the hand is a little bit different to that of the rest of the body for its motions, and so we actually use the middle finger that's the midline of our hand. Now it still means that medial side of the hand is this way, lateral side of the hand is this way if it's my right hand facing upwards like this. It just means that any motion that occurs away from the middle finger would be abduction. So if the index finger is to move this way, it would be abduction. If the index finger was to move this way, it would be adduction. Now your knuckles, which are effectively these ones, all right, here these are our metacarpophalangeal joints. And these are ellipsoid type joints. All right, so if we write that in there, metacarpophalangeal, because these are the metacarpals and these are the phalanges. So this is an ellipsoid, which means oval shaped type joint. And this will allow two ranges of motion. So abduction, adduction, flexion, and extension. So abduction, Adduction, flexion, and extension. And we'll talk about the muscles which create those actions a little bit later. Then we have here, we have interphalangeal joints. So between your phalanges, all right, on each of your fingers, you have three phalanges in your fingers, but only two phalanges in your thumb. So this one would be the proximal phalange of the thumb and the distal phalange or distal phalanx of the thumb. Whereas here we have a proximal one, an intermediate or middle, and a distal. So between these two here, we have the proximal interphalangeal joint and the distal interphalangeal joint. So interphalangeal joints, all right, these joints are, as we have said in the past, that these are hinge joints. All right, so interphalangeal joints are synovial and hinge in their shape. Therefore, all they do is flex and extend. So you can just demonstrate that with your own finger, flexion of the fingers and extension of the fingers to straighten them out. So if you were gonna expect any ligaments to be around your interphalangeal joints, because they are hinge, and as we've talked about before, you would expect that they all would have collateral ligaments, all right? And they're gonna resist sideways forces like varus and valgus forces that we've discussed in the past. All right. So ready for the next video, we'll talk about some of the muscles of the hand.